Hello and welcome back to this lecture series on CCNA3 Scaling Networks with me, Joachim Scherestad from the University of Hoverde. And now we reach chapter 6, which is EIGPR, and we're g this is the first of two chapters where we're going to dig deep in EIGPR. And the topic of this lecture is to look at the characteristics and what characterizes EIGPR, and we're then going to look at implementation for IPv4, how the protocol operates with the dual routing algorithm, and we're going to end up with implementation of IP for IPv6. And for this chapter, we're going to do two demonstrations, implementation for IPv4 and IPv6 respectively. And as always, I would encourage you to do the lab assignments in the Cisco material or do a lab on your own whenever we reach that, uh, that part of the video lecture. And as always, post me whenever I talk too quickly or too much. So looking at EI, EIGPR at a glance, it's developed uh, by Cisco and it's sort of proprietary. Uh, however, it's been available for other vendors since 2013, but there are some features that are still Cisco only. Uh, and this is something that you should be aware of. So uh, in a modern day network, you can use EIGPR even if there is a multi-vendor environment, if your vendor decided to implement EIGPR but maybe there is still other choices like OSPF that are, that are better if you have a multi-vendor uh, multi -vendor environment. Uh, it's a distance vector protocol and it does support authentication when sending router updates. However, implementing authentication is beyond the, the scope of this course, However, but you should know that it does have support for it. So looking at some of the features, it's using something that is called the dual algorithm, and that is the routing algorithm that is responsible for sending routing updates, for building routing, uh, routing table, and all of those things. And we're going to dig, dig, dig deeper into the dual algorithm uh, later in this uh, lecture. It does form neighbor, neighbor adjacencies, meaning that is it does send out hello package, uh, packages on all of it, its interfaces, and it maintains adjacencies uh, with its neighboring networks. That means that it, or with its neighboring routers, and what that actually means is that it's aware of the neighbor routers, and it does keep track of whether or not the neighboring routers are up and running. And this is basically a requirement to, st uh, to start sending routing updates. There has to be an adjacency on the link. And when if the adjacency goes down, the local router will, will consider that router to be out of the game that will cause the router to recalculate the routing table. Uh, to send those routing updates, EIGPR does not use TCP or UDP. Instead, it uses uh, the reliable transport protocol, and this is uh, the method that EIGPR uses to be protocol independent, so it can actually uh, support routing for IPv4 or IPv6, but also Apple Talk and EPX and uh, other legacy uh, layer 3 protocols. Uh, something that is quite special with EIGPR is that routing updates are sent whenever there is a topology change and they are partial and bounded, meaning that they only contain the new information about what happened and it's only sent out to the affected neighbors. Uh, it also supports load balancing and it supports unequal cost and equal cost load balancing, meaning that you can balance uh, if there are multiple routes to a one single remote network, you can load balance across those and you can even load balance even if the metric is different. We're going to go through this in, uh, in a little while. Uh, as I said, it supports routing of many layer 3 protocols, including IPv4 and v6, but and Apple Talk and other uh, deprecated protocols. And it does this by a strategy that is called protocol dependent modules. And basically, it means that you have one protocol dependent module running for each protocol, and it each PDM will handle uh, neighbor tables, topology table, routing table, and so on and so forth on its own. We're going to look at this a little bit more in detail. Uh, so, looking at a uh, real uh, reliable transport protocol that is used for uh, communication, it can actually be sent reliable or not. And when you want to say, talk RTP and do it re reliable, you'll do it with a package that requires an acknowledgement. And you do send those packages, uh, all RTP packages, as unicast or multicast using the addresses seen in, in the picture. Uh, so looking further at the different package types that are used by uh, EIGPR for communication, uh, first we have the hello packages and those are used to 
form adjacencies, discover other EG, EIGPR routers on the network. They are also sent out periodically to the neighboring network to maintain those adjacencies. And if one router stops receiving hello packages from the neighbor routering, neighboring router, it will consider that router to be down. And then we have the updates and the updates are used to send out routing information to known network. So whenever a router ha uh, is initialized, it has information about its directly connected routers. Uh, it will send this in a router update to the neighboring routers. And then when it gets information from other routers, it's going to broadcast that uh, or send that out to neighboring routers as well. The updates are also sent when there is a change in the topology and then they are bounded so they are only sent to the affected routers. So we have the acknowledgements that are used to uh, acknowledge the receipt of an EIGPR package. And then we have the query package, which, which is quite interesting. The query package can be sent to a router to request specific information from a neighboring router. So if you're a local router and one of your interfaces goes down and that, then you lose this track of a number of remote networks, then you can send a query to your uh, neighboring networks that or, or your neighboring routers that you still have a connection with and you can ask them if they have routes to the remote networks that you no longer have a route to. And then we have the reply package, which is the re reply to a query which will, which will contain routes or information about the there are no routes. Uh, the hello and acknowledgement will be sent using unreliable delivery and the rest of the packages will be sent using reliable uh, delivery. And the acknowledgement package will of course be sent in response to one of the packet types that are sent using reliable delivery. So let's look uh, a little bit more on the uh, hello packages that are used to form and maintain adjacencies. Uh, in forming adjacencies, they are sent during the initial startup of the router. And if you send out a hello package and receive one, well, then there is an adjacency formed. Uh, there are some timers for those uh, for those packages. So depending on the bandwidth of the link, the uh, the pa uh, hello packages are sent on different intervals. So if you have a link of with bandwidth 1.5 for four megabits, which would be multi-point or frame, multi-point frame relay links, then you will send hello packages every 60 seconds. And if you have a faster link than that, which is most normal uh, modern links, then the hello interval is instead five seconds. And the hold time will reflect how long a router will wait um, wait on a hello package for a neighboring. Uh, router before considering that router dead and the default hold time is three times the default hello interval which is 180 seconds for slow link and 15 seconds for faster and modern link. So what this actually means is that if you have two routers, router A and router B that form an formed an adjacency, they will send hello packages to each other every five seconds. But if router A stops receiving hello packages from router B, then it's going to wait 15 seconds for a hello package. And if it doesn't receive one, it's going to consider router B to be dead. Uh, so moving on to updates and acknowledgements. And updates are used to propagate new routing information. And as we discussed before, they're sent on demand when something happened and they are only sent to affected routers. And this on demand and sending sent on affected uh, to affected routers means that they are triggered and they're bounded. And they will of course all and they're also partial meaning that they will only include topology changes rather than flooding the whole topology with the whole with the topology as it is. And then we have the acknowledgements and those are well acknowledgements that are uh, sent in reply to any EIGPR package that is sent with reliable re re reliable delivery. Many difficult words in this lecture. Uh, finally, we have the query and reply, where the query is sent by a router to request a route to a network, and this is typically sent when a route is no longer available, as we said before, and the reply is sent in response to the query, and uh, a reply is always sent in response to a query, even if the router does not have a route, uh, have the route in question, then it will at least notify the sending router that it doesn't have the route that is being uh, queried. So uh, before we get practical, let's just look a little bit on the configuration steps. Uh, as we discussed in the previous lecture, EIGPR is a interior routing protocol. 
uh, and as such it's configured for one autonomous system and as you can see in the picture here uh, you may have uh, each and every uh, autonomous system will have their own instance of uh, EIGPR. So when you configure EIGPR, the first thing you have to do is to configure a router ID and that is used to uniquely identify a router in the domain. Then you advertise networks and here you have to uh, consider whether or not you want uh, out a summary. We're going to discuss what that is later. Uh, you're also going to uh, decide whether or not to advertise networks classful or with a wildcard mask. So what I mean with this is that you can advertise a network saying uh, something like uh, you want to advertise network 192.168.0 uh, or 5.0 and don't supply a wildcard mask. And that what will happen then is that the router will assume that you're going to uh, supply or advertise the class full network. Uh, you can also make sure that you class, uh, advertise the network as you want to and then you have to supply the wildcard mask which is the inverse of the, uh, of the subnet mask. So if you have a subnet mask of 255, 255, 255, 0 then the wildcard mask becomes 0, 0, 0, 255. Uh, last thing you, you want to do is to configure passive interfaces and a passive interface is basically an interface where you're not sending route, er, routing updates or hello packages or all of those and this is typically configured for LAN interfaces where there is no router on the other end and this is to uh, ensure first that there is no unnecessary uh, information on the other side but also to ensure that no one can put a rogue interface on an on a port that is connected to, uh, to uh, end devices and learn about the network or even install rogue routes in the networks. So uh, some commands to verify EIGPR before we move on to the practical. If we want to make sure that neighbor GCSs has been formed we use the command show IP EIGPR neighbors and that's going to show us neighbor information. Uh, we can do show IP protocols to verify the EIGPR protocol information and the summary of the configuration. And we also want to know show IP route that, that will display the routing table. So if there aren't any questions, we're going to move on to the practical. And that before we go a little bit more advanced and dig a little bit deeper into EIGPR. So let's do a practical. So uh, in this situation, we have three routers and three end networks, and then we have networks in between the routers. So the end goal here is that we're going to configure EIGPR to distribute or to make every router aware, aware of every network. Uh, and the first thing we have to do is to enable the EIGPR uh, process on each and every router but we will begin with just configuring router 1 and we're going to take this a little bit slow. So to do this for IPv4 we go to the configure terminal and then we use the command router EIGPR and then the AS number that we want to use typically we can only we can just use one. So now we are in the EIGPR configuration mode and if you do the question mark there is a whole lot of commands that we can use. Uh, for now we're just going to use the network command which is used to tell uh, EIGPR which networks to advertise or which and which interfaces that are going to uh, take part in the EIGPR process and looking at router 1 we want to uh, broadcast all directly connected networks so it will be this one the router 1 LAN it's going to be the connection network to router 3 and it's going to be the connection network to router 2 and this is a good place to tell you that in order for uh, say R1 and R2 to form an adjacency the uh, routing process has to be enabled for this network on both routers so let's begin with that uh, network and the network IP address uh, 172.16.3.0 and then if we want to we can do the wildcard mask or if we want EIGPR to consider this to be a classful network we can all we can just hit enter. Uh, in this case we want to use to work with the wildcard mask because it's a slash 
30 network and the classful version of 172.16 network is not a slash 30 network. So then we need to know what the, what the wildcard mask for slash 30 network is. And since slash 30 would mean a subnet mask of 255, 255, 255, 252, we're going to take the inverse of that, which will mean that for the first three octets, we use zero. And for the last one, we use three, which is 255 minus 252, right? And we go enter. So that's the first network. Then we do the same for the other connection network to router three. And so then the address would be 192.168.10.4, uh, the wildcard mask again, and it's the same. And then finally, we're going to advertise the network connected to the PC, which is 172.16.1.0. And in this case, the wildcard mask will be 0.0.0.255 as it's a slash 24 network and enter. Finally, uh, we don't want any routing advertisement sent out the connection to uh, to LAN. So let's see what port that is, Giga1. We're going to configure that as a passive interface that is also done from the uh, EIGPR configuration mode uh, and it's done with passive interface and just the interface name and there that is, that is done. Um, also, in this case, where we're working with networks that are not following the classful boundaries, uh, it can be a good way to just do a no auto summary. So if we have auto summary enabled, what is going to happen is that the EIGPR process is going to summarize networks uh, based on the classful boundaries. So what will happen then is that router one will eventually have a route or routes for uh, 172.16.1 and 172.16.2, right? And since the classful boundary here is at, uh, will be at 16, if I'm not mistaken, then it's going to summarize this, the route to those two networks into one single route and say that, hey, I have access to uh, 172.16 slash 16, and that is going to be a problem because in reality, it doesn't. So if you have this scenario with this continuous network, you should always do no auto summary. Actually, in my opinion, you should always do no auto summary, no matter what the case is. Uh, you should know that on some modern, more modern routers, I believe that the no auto summary is the default behavior of EIGPR, but that is not always the case. So just make it a best practice to whenever you configure EIGPR, do no auto summary. And if you want to have summarized routes, you can summarize them manually. We're going to look at how you do that in a later chapter. So that's the configura configuration for router one, which was the first one. Now let's move on to doing the same on router two. And so we go to configuration terminal. We do router EIGPR1 to start a routing process. Then we can just start doing no auto summary. And then we're going to start with uh, with advertising networks. So the first one in this case will be the router to LAN, which is 172.16.2.0 and the wildcard mask again. Uh, so next we're going to do the link to router 3, which is <coughs> 192.168.10.4. And it's slash 30, so the wildcard mask is 0003 and then we're finally going to do 172.16.3.0 with a wildcard mask again matching a slash 30 network and now you will see that since both router 1 and router 2 are advertising this network there's an adjacency formed as you can see by the output that comes to the command prompt. You can also verify that by going, okay, let's do the passive interface first. Again, we're going to do passive interface here for gigabit one because we don't want routing updates sent out to the client LAN. And so now we do end and we're just going to do show EIG, show IP EIGPR neighbors. And you can see here 
that there is a neighbor located here on uh, 172.16.3.1 and it's on the interface serial zero 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 and you can also see uh, the whole timer uh, how long it's been up the whole time is actually how long it will accept waiting before there is a new hello package sent and if the hold timer will reach zero it would consider the JCC to be down so before we move on let's do router 3 uh, just real quick configuration terminal uh, again we do router EIGPR1 to enable EIGPR for the AS number one we're going to do uh, no auto summary. We're going to do passive interface gigabit ethernet 01 and then we're going to do the networks network 192.168.1.0.000.255 and then we're going to do 192.168 dot 10 dot 8 0 0 0 3 there is a new adjacency being formed and then finally we're going to do 10 dot 4 and there should be another adjacency being formed so now that we we'll, uh, configure this the dual algorithm will run and there will be routing updates sent out each and every interface and we can fast forward time a little bit to have the routers converge and if we add router, router 3 here go end and we do a show IP route we can look at the routing table and then there are a few things that I want to show you here so we know from history that a C in the routing table let's make it even bigger a C in the routing table denotes a directly connected network and an L uh, is a directly connected special route for the directly connected interfaces so uh, but there is now also a number of networks available with a D and D would mean that it's a route learned through EIGPR here we have the administrative uh, distance which is 90 which is default for EIGPR and that denotes the trustworthiness of this route and then we have the metric as you can see here uh, and you can actually see for the route to 172.16.3 being, uh, being the network here, uh, you can see the network between router 1 and router 2, you can see that there are actually two, two routes being installed. And this is load balancing in action for you. Here you see in the metric value that the, metrics is the metric is the same for both routes. Therefore, it has been uh, both routes has been installed into the routing table, and both routes will be used to share the load of traffic going to, to that network. So this is load balancing in action for you. Um, as a final task, I just want to show you show IP protocols, and we can see some summary information for EIGPR. So first up from the begin from the beginning, we have. Uh, information about the routing process. Routing protocol is EIGPR1. Uh, you can see that we're re redistributing in EIGPR1. Uh, here is some information about the running metrics that we're going to uh, talk about later. You can see the local router ID, which we're also going to discuss next. Uh, you can see if we're using automatic summary or not. You can see what networks we're routing for. You can see what passive interfaces we have, and you can see what uh, what routing information sources we have namely what routers that are sending updates to this router so that's it for this demonstration let's move on to the theory and as i said i would encourage you to take the chance to stop here and do the practical on your own if you haven't already done so <clears throat> so there we are let's look into the uh, dual algorithm a little bit more so first off, I want to take you through the process of how discovering of neighbor works. So what happens when the router boots up with EIGPR is that, as you can see in the picture here, it's going to send out a hello package saying, hello, I'm router one, is anyone there? And then if there is an EIGPR uh, router on the other side, it's going to re respond with first an update saying, well, here is all my routing information. And 
then it's going to say hello i'm router 2 is anyone there and at this point an adjacent adjacency is formed so this is the process of discovering neighbors where one router comes up sends a hello package and if it gets an update package and a hello package in return then the adjacency between those two routers is formed so how will the confer uh, how will the convergence work well in this case router one didn't really send any information to router two yet so in response to the update package that it got from router two it's going to say it send an acknowledgement saying oh nice here is the information and also an update saying here is my routing information and then router two is going to respond with an acknowledgement and at this point we have reached convergence between those two routers because each router is aware of the networks connected to the other router if there were more routers uh, in this topology then this routing update and acknowledgement process would go on for a little while until all routers are aware of all networks of course so that's it for convergence real quick and for the practical theoretical test i would uh, recommend you to make note of the order in which those uh, in those packages are sent because it's quite likely to end up on a practical or a theoretical test near you so moving on we're going to discuss the metric and bear with me here i know that the metric used by eigpr is a little bit complex uh, but I'm trying, gonna try to make it easy for you. So, uh, as we said, EIGPR uses a composite metric of bandwidth, delay, reliability, and load. And for bandwidth, it uses the lowest bandwidth among all outgoing interfaces. For delay, it uses the, com uh, the combined delay of all links. For reliability and load, it uses the worst among all links. So, by default, uh, the metric is actually not made up from re reliability and load, but just the bandwidth and the delay. Um, and as such, the default uh, formula used when calculating the metric is K1, which is basically uh, the K values here are big, can basically be 1 or 0 and dictates if a uh, metric is being used. So K1 uh, is going to be 1 times the bandwidth. That is uh, going to be one part of the metric. And then we have K3, which is going to be 1 times the delay. And that's going to be the other part of the metric. And those two are brought together. So then the full metric is going to be uh, is going to be multiplied with 256 and that is because 256 is the default value for the reliability part which is but when the reliability part is not used then you still have to have the default value of 256 to have a big enough metric number to match the uh, to match where which should you say the way that the metric should look so if you want to the complete composite formula is k at, uh, k1 times bandwidth plus k2 times bandwidth slash 256 minus load plus k3 times delay and that's how much we're going to care so uh, just make sure that you understand that the default uh, formula or the default metric is made up from bandwidth and delay and that means that K1 and K3 is set to one, and then we have the uh, then we have the reliability and load that can it could also be used if you want to, uh, but we're not doing that by default. So looking a little bit more on how to calculate a bandwidth uh, metric, the bandwidth uh, bandwidth is made from the configured bandwidth of a link. And as you know, when you're configuring an interface, you can use the bandwidth command to uh, to change the bandwidth, and that is going to be the configured bandwidth and not the uh, the actual bandwidth. Then the bandwidth with met metric is actually calculated using 10,000 divided by the bandwidth. Uh, and uh, it's not using the combined bandwidth across all lengths, only the slowest one. So the idea here is that the slower the band bandwidth, the higher the metric. Um, and for the delay, a static value is simply assigned depending on media type. As you can see in the table here, the delay value for gigabit ethernet is 10, for fast ethernet is 
it's 100 and if you were to have a T1 serial link it would be 20,000. So looking more on the metric, the sum of the bandwidth and delay metric is finally multiplied by 256. And as I said, the 256 represent using EIGPR without using reliability in the metric and multiplying with the 256 is needed in order to get the 32-bit metric that is required by EIGPR. So the steps of calculating the default metric would be to first identify the slowest link in kilobits and then we do uh, 10,000 divide or 10 million, I'm wrong here, 10 million divided by the bandwidth in kilobits. And then we determine the, the delay for all links across the path and add up. And then we divide the total by 10. And then we add uh, the two numbers and multiply by 256. I know that's complicated. Try to learn it. Just contemplate a little bit about the formula. Before we move on to dual, so now we're going to look more uh, more deeply into the dual algorithm. And what does it do? Well, dual algorithm is here to provide loop-free paths. Uh, as you know from the switching parts, we don't want any loops in our network. Uh, when we're talking about layer three uh, data, uh, loops aren't that much of a problem. Uh, it's still a problem, but not equally much as in layer two because there is a time to live field in the IP packages. Uh, but we still want the loops to be, or the networks to be uh, loop free so that we can have smooth and effective routing processes. Uh, Dual also provides loop free backup paths that can be used immediately. And the idea here is that if the primary route fails, then Dual will already know about a backup route that it can uh, quickly install into the routing table. And this gives fast convergence time. Uh, and it also uses minimum bandwidth, and this is because of the bounded and partial updates. So it will only send updates to routers that are affected by the router. So looking more into dual, uh, it uses something that is called a finite state machine or an FSM to calculate loop-free path. We're going to look a little bit about, uh, at the finite state machine, but not in detail. Uh, you should know that running the finite state machine is resource intense. Uh, therefore, we need to do it as uh, few times as possible. And we also know, uh, and I want to stress this, we also know that Dual keeps track of backup routes uh, if, and is all such, as such able to quickly replace failing routes if needed. So uh, some of the terminology that we need to know about when we're uh, talking about Dual is first successor. And a successor is a neighbor, neighboring router that's, that is the next hop for a least cost route. Uh, so you can say, if you will, that the successor is, uh, is the route that we're currently using. Then we have a feasible distance, and that is the lowest calculated metric to reach a remote network. We have a feasible successor, which is the next hop for a backup route, and it has to satisfy a feasibility condition in order to be a feasible successor. Uh, and a feasibility condition is basically when a neighbor's reported distance is less than the local router's feasible distance to a remote network. There's going to be a picture next that explains this a little bit more. Uh, then we have the reported distance, which is the neighbor's feasible distance to a network. So not complicated yet. Let's do a picture. Uh, this is the output from the command show uh, IP EGP, EIGPR topology, and that is the topology table ma maintained by EIGPR, where it uh, where Dual maintains all routes to all networks. And starting with the successor, I just want to show you in this picture that I've marked um, I marked a network here. So what's within the uh, what's within the marked field here is routes to the network 192.168.10.4. Uh, as you can see here we have one successor we have one next hop router uh, and you see the successor here the first uh, the the first the next hop that we want to use is the successor so the successor in this case is 192.168.10.10 and um, we also have a feasible distance. So the feasible distance in this case is 
the metric of the best path, the path that we want to take. So for the successor, 192.168.10.10, for this path, the metric is this, which is the same as the feasible distance, the metric of the best path, which is the feasible distance. Then, after the metric, we have the reported distance. And the reported distance, that is the metric, if you will, for, for the neighboring router. So for this route, for this route here, for the successor, the metric to reach this network from the successor is the reported distance. So the reported distance, that's the neighboring router's network uh, metric to the network. And if the reported distance is lower than the local feasible distance, as in this case, then the, this route will become a feasible successor. So a feasible successor here, you can see that the metric here from the local router is higher than for the successor, but this route is still a feasible successor, and that is because the reported distance is lower than the local feasible distance. So yeah, I know that this gets a little bit complicated, but, we, we, but we're going to do some labs with it and look at it a little bit more in practice. Uh, I also want to highlight the state. And the state here is denoted by a P, and P is for passive, and that basically means that a route is stable. Uh, it can also be an A, meaning active, and active with dual terminology means that there is a dual recalculation or search for a new route being in process. So P means that it's, it's up and running and working and nothing is happening to it, and A means that dual is doing something to it, like trying to find a new path. So that's the EIGPR topology table for you. And now let's go on to looking at the finite state machine. So the finite state machine is going to be run to find routes either during initial startup or when something happens. So the finite state machine is, as we said, there to ensure that there are loop free parts to remote network. So it's activated whenever their uh, connectivity to a successor is lost. And then the first thing that does happen is, as you see here, that it looks in the topology table and looks if there, are there is a feasible successor. If the answer is yes, then it's going to promote the feasible successor to the successor, install the successor in the routing table, and then select a new successor and install them into to the topology table and life, everything will be good. However, if there is not a feasible successor available, then it's going to place the destination network in an active state. What happens then is that it's going to query neighbors for new routes using the query packets. And then we can have one of two things happening. Either the neighbor has a route and then it's going to uh, install that route as a new successor if it's feasible and if it's not uh, if the neighboring router does not have a route then it's going to remove the destination uh, network from the topology and routing tables so everything clear as day no didn't think so if there are any questions on this leave them in the comments field or take the opportunity to talk to a supervisor in class and now we're going to end this lecture with just a couple of slides on EIGPR for IPv6, and then we're going to do a practical on IPv6 EIGPR implementation. Uh, so looking at some of the differences, um, uh, or do a comparison, first off, uh, advertised routes for uh, in EGPR for IPv4 is of course the IPv4 IPv4 networks, and for IPv6 it's the IPv6 networks. Uh, both are distance vector protocols, both use the dual, both use the same net, uh, metric, both use reliable transport protocol for transport, uh, both do updates and neighbor discovery in the same way, source and destination addresses are of course uh, different, the authentication is based on MD5 and SHA-256 in both cases, and the router ID is in both cases a 32-bit router ID. And we're going to explore in the next lecture how the, uh, how the router ID is set and how it works. Uh, so uh, 
let's look at the uh, configuration differences because for some reason uh, Cisco decided to do IPv6 configuration a little bit different. So first off EIGPR uses link local IPv6 addresses for routing updates and it can be convenient to configure them and but if you don't the router will create one using the EUI64 process. Uh, also, the network command is not being used to advertise networks, rather the interface command IPv6, EIGPR uh, and then the ACE number is used to en enable EIGPR on an interface and that's going to cause the network to be advertised and enable the router to form adjacencies on the interface. And this can be a little bit tr tricky to remember because it's easy to say that uh, think that you only do the interface command on the interface where adjacencies is going to be formed, but you have to do this interface command on all interfaces belonging to networks that has to be advertised. Uh, also, you have to uh, enable IPv6 routing if that hasn't already been done, and you do that with the command IPv6 unicast routing, uh, and you need to enable the uh, routing process using the no shutdown the EIGPR configuration mode. Uh, this is what it says in the Cisco material, but it's actually from my practical experience not always the case. Well, with that said, let's go practical before we end this lecture. If there are any questions, you know where to leave them by now. So we're back in uh, Packet Tracer and we're just going to make some basic IPv6 EIGPR configuration. And basically the, the, everything is as before, but there is a difference and that is that we're going to do the interface command for EIGPR to enable uh, routing for networks and we're also going to assign router IDs uh, statically. And that is because, as you will discover in the next lecture, uh, the router ID is chosen from one of the local IPv4 addresses and since there aren't any uh, IPv4 addresses in this topology we have to assign the router ID statically. So let's just start uh, with configuring router 1 as we did before. And we do it again from configuration terminal and one thing that we have to do on these routers is that we have to begin with enabling the IPv6 routing process which we do by I, with just using IPv6 unicast routing. Uh, next, just as before, we're going to enable the EIGPR process. Since we're doing it for IPv6, we have to use uh, IPv6 uh, router uh, EIGPR and the ACE number, which in this case is going to be 1. Now, the only thing that we're going to do here is beginning with doing EIGPR router ID to configure a router ID, and it is structured as an IPv4 address, and in this case we go router ID 1111. And that's it. And also this is where we configure passive interfaces. And we're going to have passive interface gigabit 01, which for router one is the interface pointing to the PC1 LAN. And uh, uh, here we're going to do the interface command for EIGPR on this interface, but doing it passive means that there are not going to be any routing updates sent out the interface. However, the, the network will still be a part of the routing process. So that's be, that being done, we're going to go into the different interfaces and enable uh, IPv6 EIGPR. We do that by going interface and then we can start with gigabit01 and the command uh, IPv6 EIGPR and then the ACE number which is 1. And that's basically it. So we're going to do the same for the other interfaces, beginning with interface serial 0, 0, 0 uh, IPv6 EIGPR1, zero, 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 001 IPv6 EIGPR1 again. So let's go do the same on router 2. So we go enable, we go configure terminal, and then IPv6 unicast routing to enable uh, to enable IPv6 routing, and then we go IPv6 router EIGPR. So here is a good a good time to uh, to just see that when we're working with IPv6, usually the difference with a command is that we use IPv6 instead uh, in front of any command, or we use IPv6 instead of using IP. So for IPv4, the command to en enable EGPR is just router EIGPR. And with it, when we want to enable it for IPv6, we have to put IPv6 before. 
So that's it. Then we go EIGPR router ID. This one is router two, so it's gonna be two, 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 two. And then we go again, passive interface, gigabit ethernet, zero, one. And we go exit. So instead of doing the network commands, again, we do the interface commands. So we start with interface, gigabit ethernet, zero, one. That wasn't even close to being correct. And we do IPv6 EIGPR1, which would be the equivalent of doing network and supplying the network address for this network within uh, within IPv4. And so then we go to the serial interfaces. Uh, interface serial zero 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 IPv6 EIGPR1. And then we do the final interface. And now we should see that an adjacency should be formed. Did Cisco go evil on us? So let's do a show IPv6 EIDPR neighbor. PR. EIGPR neighbors and this of course something that something that we forgot configuration terminal IPv6 router EIGPR1 something that you have to do for a routing process when we're working with IPv6 is to do the no shutdown we're gonna do it on the on router one as well so we do IPv6 router EIGPR1 to go into the router configuration mode and then we do no shutdown and now we should see that neighbors being for neighbor adjacency is being formed with router between router 1 and router 2 and let's go router 3 and do everything correct from the beginning so again for router 3 we go to configuration terminal we enable IPv6 routing and then we do IPv6 router EIGPR1 to do the router configuration, we're going to do an EIGPR router ID, and it's going to be 3333. We do passive interface for the gigabit port, because we don't want routing updates being sent out to LAN. We then do a no shutdown, which we now learned, and we're going back to the interfaces to enable routing for the network stuff we want. So we begin with interface, gigabit ethernet, zero, 01. IPv6 EIGPR1 and then we do interface serial 0 0 0 IPv6 EIGPR1 and now we get adjacency uh, right there and then for the final interface serial 0 0 1 IPv6 EIGPR1 and go and what we now manage to do is configure uh, EIGPR for IPv6. So let's do end here and look at some show commands beginning with uh, show IPv6 route to display the IPv6 routing table. And you should see that it's rather long, but there are some uh, some routes here that are, are learned through, uh, through EIGPR. And next we're going to look at show IPv6 EIGPR neighbors to show the neighboring routers. And you can see that there are two. Let's do the output a little bit better. There's one connected on each serial interface. You can see the hold timer again, uh, dictating how long uh, this router will wait for a uh, hello package before considering the link to be down. You can see the uptime of this neighbor adjacency and so on and so forth. Uh, I also want to uh, show you show IPv6 EIG PR topology and this is the topology table as we saw before here we have uh, the different uh, the different routes or the different remote networks you can see that the state here is passive meaning that the route is stable and you can see if we examine this first route a little bit more in detail you can see that it has two successors and in this case it has two successors because as you see here there are two routes to this network 
and the fees or and the metric to dose networks are actually equal, meaning that we have load balancing. You can see the feasible uh, or the reported distance here, which is the metric reported by the neighboring router. So now we're on router three. And if we look at the path to this remote network, DB8 Cafe A111, that one, which is this network, you can see that there is one route going through FE81 and FE82, that's router one and router two. And if we look, examine this one, FE81, a little bit closer, you can see that it will be this path, right? Router three to router one and then in. And you can see that the metric is this, which is the same as the feasible distance. So this is the metric to, from router three to this network. And then we have the reported distance here. And the reported distance is the metric that router one has to reach the same metric. So router three is saying, hey, my network is, or my metric is this. And then router one says, okay, that's good. My metric to the same network would be this. And then router, router three in this case will consider that the reported distance. And as long as the reported distance of a network is lower than the feasible distance, then it will be considered a feasible successor. Or in this case, both are successors because the metric is actually the same. So that's it for uh, basic EIGPR and see you next time where we're going to look at tweaking and troubleshooting EIGPR and until next time, have a good time.